Histories, Volume 1, by Herodotus of Halicarnassus. Translated by A. D. Godley. Book 2, Part 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The next to reign after Proteus, they said, was Rampsinitus. This king, they told me, had great wealth in silver, so great that none of the succeeding kings could surpass or come near it. To store his treasure safely he had a stone chamber built, one of its walls abutting on the outer side of his palace. But the builder of it shrewdly provided that one stone should be so placed as to be easily removed by two men, or even by one. So, when the chamber was finished, the king stored his treasure in it, and as time went on, the builder, drawing near the end of his life, summoned his sons, he had two, and told them how he had provided for them, that they have an ample livelihood, by the art with which he had built the king's treasure-house. Explaining clearly to them how to remove the stone, he gave the coordinates of it, and told them that if they kept these in mind, they would be the custodians of the king's riches. So, when he was dead, his sons got to work at once, come into the palace by night, they readily found and managed the stone in the building, and took away much of the treasure. When the king opened the building, he was amazed to see the containers lacking their treasure, yet he did not know whom to accuse, seeing that the seals were unbroken, and the building shut fast. But when less treasure appeared the second and third times he opened the building, for the thieves did not stop plundering, he had traps made, and placed around the containers in which his riches were stored. The thieves came just as before, and one of them crept in. When he came near the container, right away he was caught in the trap. When he saw the trouble he was in, he called to his brother right away, and explained to him the problem, and told him to come in quickly and cut off his head, lest he be seen and recognised, and destroy him too. He seemed to have spoken rightly to the other, who did as he was persuaded, and then, replacing the stone, went home, carrying his brother's head. When day came, the king went to the building, and was amazed to see in the trap the thief's body without a head, yet the building intact, with no way in or out. At a loss he did as follows. He suspended the thief's body from the wall, and set guards over it instructing them to seize and bring to him any whom they saw weeping or making lamentation. But the thief's mother, when the body had been hung up, was terribly stricken. She had words with her surviving son, and told him that he was somehow to think of some way to cut loose and bring her his brother's body, and if he did not obey, she threatened to go to the king and denounce him as having the treasure. So, when his mother bitterly reproached the surviving son, and for all that he said he could not dissuade her, he devised a plan. He harnessed asses, and put skins full of wine on the asses, then set out driving them, and when he was near those who were guarding the hanging body, he pulled at the feet of two or three of the skins, and loosed their fastenings, and as the wine ran out, he beat his head and cried aloud, like one who did not know to which ass he should turn first, while the guards, when they saw the wine flowing freely, ran out into the road with cups, and caught what was pouring out, thinking themselves in luck. Feigning anger, the man cursed all, but as the guards addressed him peaceably, he pretended to be soothed, and to relent in his anger, and finally drove his asses out of the road, and put his harness in order. And after more words passed, and one joked with him, and got him to laugh, he gave them one of the skins, and they lay down there, just as they were, disposed to drink, and included him, and told him to stay and drink with them, and he consented and stayed. When they cheerily saluted him in their drinking, he gave them yet another of the skins, and the guards grew very drunk with the abundance of liquor, and lay down right there where they were drinking, overpowered by sleep. But he, when it was late at night, cut down the body of his brother, and shaved the right cheek of each of the guards for the indignity. 
and loading the body on his asses, drove home, fulfilling his mother's commands. When the king learnt that the body of the thief had been taken, he was beside himself, and, obsessed with finding out who it was who had managed this, did as follows, they say, but I do not believe it. He put his own daughter in a brothel, instructing her to accept all alike, and before having intercourse, to make each tell her the shrewdest and most impious thing he had done in his life. Whoever told her the story of the thief, she was to seize and not let go. The girl did as her father told her, and the thief, learning why she was doing this, did as follows, wanting to get the better of the king by craft. He cut the arm off a fresh corpse at the shoulder, and went to the king's daughter, carrying it under his cloak, and when asked the same question as the rest, he said that his most impious act had been when he had cut the head off his brother, who was caught in a trap in the king's treasury, and his shrewdest, that after making the guards drunk, he had cut down his brother's hanging body. When she heard this, the princess grabbed for him, but in the darkness the thief let her have the arm of the corpse, and clutching it she held on, believing that she had the arm of the other. But the thief, after giving it to her, was gone in a flash out of the door. When this also came to the king's ears, he was astonished at the man's ingenuity and daring, and in the end he sent a proclamation to every town, promising the thief immunity and a great reward if he would come into the king's presence. The thief trusted the king and came before him. Ramsinitus was very admiring, and gave him his daughter to marry on the grounds that he was the cleverest of men. For, as the Egyptians, he said, surpassed all others in craft, so he surpassed the Egyptians. 